The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network presents Worldview Media Podcast, where Gordon and Joyce Runyon view popular media through the lens of the biblical five point covenant model to help believers appreciate and apply principles of exciting narrative and engaging storytelling. Coming to you live from the original Danger Room in the mansion of Charles Xavier. This is the Worldview Media Podcast. I'm your host, Gordon Runyon. <laughs> What's your superpower? What's your mutation? <laughs> oh, his mutation. Well, yeah, I don't know if we want to go there. <laughs> it's a very gruesome mutation. <laughs> 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 Well, that's the way to start, Carmen. <laughs> yeah, you threw me for a loop there. All right, I'm Gordon Runyon, and my co-hosts are my wife, Joyce. Hello. Hello. Daughter, Carmen. Hello. Hello. And. Hello. <laughs> and we have a special remote host from... Uh, Texas. From Texas, I was going to say he was from uh, Sebastian Shaw's yacht. Oh, Oh, no. That makes it sound like he's a bad guy. (laughs) He's not a bad guy. Are you a bad guy? (laughs) We have have Dylan Sanchez. Hello, my friend. Hello there. Are you ready to talk about this movie? What's the the movie we're talking about? (laughs) X-Men. First, First class. class. Oh, man, I was about to say Days of Future Past. I haven't seen that one yet, so we can't talk about it. Oh, okay. That's embarrassing. X-Men First Class. And in this movie, we kind of get an origin story for uh, the relationship between Professor X and Magneto mm-hmm. and Mystique. Yeah. And the X-Men as X-Men. Yeah. So it's all kind of an origin story in there and definitely Magneto's origin story Mm -hmm. and so we have them having to kind of band together in an uneasy truce to save the world from nuclear war Uh, saving the world and some bad evil mutants trying to start that war Led by Kevin Bacon. Who would have thought? Uh, right. He's just a little bit you too foot I was, loose. I was so disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so disappointed. It happens. And so let's uh, talk here about overall. What do you think about these things? Let's let our guests go first. By the way, we should... Uh, we should let it be known, just all cards on the table. The reason Dylan Sanchez wanted to be on a superhero worldview media podcast is because... I don't know! <laughs> he's, uh, he's pretty much convinced I don't know what I'm talking about. Well, <laughs> depending on the topic. <laughs> he says, no, no, not true. <laughs> He he just wants to contribute and play along, and so oh, okay, all right. Well, he may disagree with me on some things, which is fine. <laughs> uh, I'm kind of used to it in my home. <laughs> <laughs> and so let's let Dylan talk first, sir. Give us your uh, kind of overall thoughts on this movie. What'd you like about it? If there's anything you didn't like, or, or just uh, let us have it. Yeah, well, I definitely like the movie and the X-Men series in general. Um, I mean, I don't really have any major problems. I mostly just have problems with, like, their power set. Because, I mean, like, I know in the comics, like, they're way more powerful than they are and that they portray them in the movies, which I guess is fine. They don't need to make them as powerful as they are in the comics. So, I mean, it's not really a huge problem, just, you know, a minor one. Uh, like, uh, who in particular did they have to tone down, or do you think they toned down a lot? Uh, well, the main one would be Magneto. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's uh, considered what uh, you would call an Omega-level mutant, so mm-hmm. well, he's I definitely th- not, not kind of, I mean, he's like getting there. He's learning his powers in this movie. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so... Is Omega level like? Yeah. Is that? The, that's a big deal. So like. That's the big deal. Yeah, like you have 
the kind of like piddly sort of like average right, mutant, right. and then <laughs> you know the VIPs of the mutants are like the omega levels. That these guys, when one of these guys shows up, you have to get like a hundred, you know, bunch a bunch of like those regular level mutants to like show up. Like um, like who's regular? Like uh, regular would be would that be like Banshee? Brilliant. Banshee, yeah. yeah, you know, um, Cyclops, Cyclops, you know, uh, Wolverine, Wolverine's kind of low level. Wolverine is yeah. low level. Yeah, because <laughs> the thing is, is that all those powers, like, oh yeah, that's a really cool power that you know I can heal and recover and stuff like yeah. that. But that's just him. He can't do anything else with that, you know. Yeah. Whereas the world that we live in and the type of ability because he anything metal you know so yeah. you just go anything metal you see him in the movie he's pulling people's teeth out of their heads yeah he's moving <laughs> you know trains and ships you see it in other stuff that he's like um this one of the older x-men that he you know there's too much iron in somebody's blood and he physically just pulls, pulls the out. iron yeah. out like that's that's what i'm talking about like you know what you're saying <laughs> is omega like level some serious yeah some serious dude yeah and I think he's right with that, is that he's not quite there yet, but you can see it start coming, and it's like, what? That's cool. Well, you know who seemed really powerful? We've totally interrupted Dylan's thing here, but... Let's see. No, you're good, you're good. <laughs> if you're going to hang, you got to learn. <laughs> the villain that I thought seemed really powerful was Azazel. Azazel? Yeah. yeah. I mean, he seemed like, how are you going to fight this guy? I mean, he was... Well, he's he's got, he was outrageous. I'm pretty sure... Pretty sure um, Azazel is actually supposed to be Nightcrawler's dad. So oh, that's really, okay. yeah, that's yeah. really just kind of right. Nightcrawler's. Well, that makes sense. Um, that's true. And, and uh, Mystique is Nightcrawler's mom. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so there's like also. Isn't that's why Mystique he's blue. also Storm's mom? No, she's supposed to be uh, Rogue's mom. Rogue's mom. Storm is supposed to be married to Black Panther. Well, who is Storm's mom? Is just a regular Storm. old Mrs. Person. Storm. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know everybody's family tree, but they're not all like well, it they're is, not all publicized either. No, they? it is a huge oh, uh, like big. What's his name? Havoc is Cyclops' his brother. Older brother, yeah. Oh, they really? have the same powers. All there's right. a there's a second. It's Havoc and then Cyclops and then there's one in between them and I can never remember his name. But there's like three of them. There's three Summers and they all have the same kind of like really difficult to control red energy mm. and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But the the X Men are big, like, uh, yeah. So they're big, tiered, very tiered, and it's very soap opera esque, <laughs> <laughs> very intermingled. Yeah. And, so yeah. I dated this guy, and you know, married this one, and you right, know, now I'm right. with this other one. But so, sounds like today. <laughs> yes. Okay. So Dylan, uh, what in particular did you like about the movie? What they do well, in your opinion? Um. I like the way that they brought all the, you know, the beginning of the X-Men uh, characters together because, you know, this isn't like, this is technically a prequel to the other movies that they've made before, you know, it's a newer movie. Yeah. Um, so I, I like the way that, how they brought uh, Mystique into Professor X's life and how it showed that um, and how, you know, she was the first, like, you know, the first uh, person to be in his life, which like kind of started the school, so to speak. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, it really just kicked everything off. And then you got, like, the suits, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the, pretty cool. The X, you know, like, they, they did a little, like, the Easter egg, you know, the X on the box when they first got their suits. Mm, so, I mean, yeah. there's just different elements. The old school blue the, and the yellow. The villain was good to a yeah. certain extent. I mean, he's not my favorite. and he's, I mean, he's, not, he's not very well known, but he is. he was a pretty good villain. Yeah. Yeah, that was good. He's not Magneto, though. Magneto would be, like, no. definitely one of my favorite villains. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But is he a villain? Really? Yeah, he is. <laughs> <laughs> is he? I don't know. I've got a thesis. That's, <laughs> that's de- debatable. Yeah. He didn't have to be a villain. I mean, uh, for a long time. That's for after the break, buddy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a worldview kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's not break our own sections. All right. Well, Miss Runyon, Mrs. Runyon. <laughs> <laughs> Which one? <laughs> Let me get my prefixes straight. I'm yeah. looking at Mrs. Runyon. What do you think of the movie? I I like it. Uh, it's for a lot of the same reasons reasons that Dylan has said. You know that it's uh, an origin to see where 
uh, Charles and Eric have come from, uh, how their lives have been similar. Have they been similar? I don't know. We'll have to talk about or that. Or completely different. <laughs> completely different, but absolutely the same. <laughs> so um, it's just really neat to see how things have have evolved. So I think they were very clever in how they brought the movie together and bringing the characters together. I think the actors that they got were fantastic. Mm -hmm. I They, you know... On the nose. <laughs> I love the scene where uh, Charles is putting the hat on to try to find everybody, and he's all like, hey, don't mess with my hair. And, you know, <laughs> and it's just all these little clues and nuggets. He's and, joking and, about going yeah, bald. Yeah, and ha-has. And, and <laughs> then, of course, you know, well, yeah, yeah you, you shouldn't have put the hat on. <laughs> so I really like this movie a lot. I, I think it's an, a nice bridge for what the the other movies were before with the mature casts and um and then what they brought in after that right right and you carmen overall thoughts overall thoughts i really i like this movie thumbs up thumbs um, up yeah thumbs up i mean i i have a pretty easy taste in movies and it's probably <laughs> probably worse for superhero you don't movies, say but, you know i like i like most of what i see but i really do like this movie a lot um i think it's uh I think it's the most X Men of the X Men movies, you know, <laughs> that you like watch the the old ones, and I'm like, okay, well this is good, but then you watch F Days of, Fu of uh, Future Past, and you're like, oh, okay, well that's good too, but you watch this one, you're like, that's it right there, <laughs> and that might just be me being like colored from the like the old school yeah. cartoons and stuff like that. That yeah. that's that's kind of what I see. That's kind of the vibe that it has, you know. That maybe it's a little bit dated, and maybe it's a little bit, you know. Like kind of tongue in cheek, but yeah. I think you can't do I, you can't do a superhero movie without being a little bit tongue in cheek at some points. Yeah, sure. But you know, I, I have to agree with my uh, predecessors that it's you know the relationships between the characters are really good in this, and you know that's what makes X Men so good is all of the relationships. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, we just have the Wolverine movies, yeah. which we did have, and some of them were better than others. Yeah. Um. But yeah, good. Good stuff. Good, solid. And you don't have to have seen the other movies to watch this. You can just nope. watch this and you're good. And you don't have to see the movies after it. I mean, this is just a real well, solid this one by itself. actually might be a good one if you haven't watched any X-Men or any Wolverine or yeah. anything. If you're going to start, this might be the logical place to start. Yeah, right? at this point. Yeah. Just know that the special effects get a lot worse. <laughs> <laughs> if you go the farther back you go. Oh, my. Well... Uh, I liked the movie, and what I liked about it, I think the most was the character development that takes place. I think they do really, for a modern movie and for an action movie and a mm -hmm. superhero movie, you've got these three main characters that are really, they've all got definite story character arcs and, and interaction and their relationships are building and changing and... Mm -hmm. So I really felt like the the main three, Mystique and Professor X and Magneto, I, I was. It's kind of amazing how much they were able to do with them, just as characters, as people, and mm, yeah, uh, I thought that was really well done. It's not my favorite superhero movie, but all right, X Men movie. Is it my favorite X Men movie? I can't say that because I I miss, I haven't seen the last. Wolverine, Logan, mm, I haven't yeah. seen that one yet, and I haven't seen Days of Future Past yet, for sure. And I might be missing another Wolverine somewhere, so I can't, I can't say. <laughs> but of the ones I've seen, I'd say this is probably my favorite. What about you, Dylan? How's this rank in terms of the other X-Men's? This one's good. I, I like it. Me personally, I like Days of Future Past more. Um, mm. I know the Wolverines are like considered an X-Men movie, but it's more of like... It's own thing. I, I try to set, like separate them to a certain extent because they don't always include X Men characters. Usually, it's him on his own. Yeah. So I love Wolverine, so I try to separate <laughs> them because I'm gonna be really biased and I'm gonna say Wolverine all the way. So like, <laughs> like straight up X Men movies. This one's this one's up there. I like Days of Future Past more. I think I'll put that one at number one though. Wow. All right. 
Well, Wolverine surely did provide the best scene in this movie. <laughs> oh, no. The one where he, where he pushes him off of the thing, and then in the in the ship, and he's all, you stay away from me. And he's like, oh, okay, man. Okay. <laughs> I like that uh, <laughs> So I just want to know how much he got paid for the cameo. It was a lot. That, that's what I want to know. It was a lot. <laughs> it was a lot of money, I think. Yeah. I think I remember seeing it, but it was quite a bit of money for him to come I bet. on. That's right. Yeah, and and all these places where it would seem so obvious to all right, let's switch out Wolverine and get some younger person in there, and there he is. And so it's just always kind of fun too that that there he is. Makes sense because he's supposed to be just this dude for you know yeah. since yeah. the. You know, what is it, revolution? But everybody before? else is different. You know, that's what I'm saying. Everybody else is different, but there's Wolverine. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think that was a nice touch. Really. Something we can hold on to. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anything else to say just in terms of overall movie quality or anything like that? Story issues? or I think it's a really tight script. Like, story-wise, I think it's very, like... Things happen and they all connect with each other. I'm still upset about... I'm going to throw it in there. I'm still upset about Darwin. I think Darwin should have uh... made it through. But... <laughs> They had to pull a Coulson, and they needed someone to die, so they killed the guy who's supposed to adapt. But that's <laughs> that's all I'm going to waste on that. I, well. Ironically, I noticed that with with Darwin, like how Professor X and Magneto go to recruit everybody. It, it, he's the only one that they didn't show them actually approaching, like recruiting. Yeah. Oh. He was just, he was just there in the room with them. Yeah. Oh, I see. He was there to be killed. Well, they they catch him. They, <laughs> it, it might be an extended scene, but they do. He's a they. He takes they take his taxi. Yeah, they take his taxi. You somewhere. know, he's all where where do you guys want to go? And he's all to the so far yeah, yeah, away. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so then they, he talks oh, yeah, about right. yeah. yeah, but no, I'm I'm all I'm all Darwin all the way. <laughs> go Darwin. <laughs> all right, not. Not Darwin. Darwin the X Men. Darwin the mutant deserved better. <laughs> All right. We're mutant and proud. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, with that said, let's go ahead and we will put an end to this segment. We'll come back with segment two and talk more worldview stuff in just a moment. Are you interested in Christian education? Would you like to learn how to be a Christian teacher or how to run your very own Christian school with success? The GCS Apprenticeship Program can help. Learn more on our website at gcsapprenticeship.com. The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you a complete lineup of podcasts where you will hear practical and tactical theology. Our desire is not simply that you consume our shows, but that you also live out your faith in every area of life. We can talk all day long about these things, but if we fail to put them into practice, then we fail as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, our King. Subscribe now to your favorite Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network shows, or you can subscribe to the Reconstructionist Radio Master Feed, where all of the content we produce including the audiobooks and audio articles, will pop up as soon as they are available. And don't forget to visit ReconstructionistRadio.com to volunteer as a narrator or to partner with this ministry financially. May the Holy Spirit stir you into action for Christ and His Kingdom. And we're back, Worldview Media Podcast. We just did segment two. <laughs> it's <What>? a flashback. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like suddenly it's like it never happened. days of future past. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, what a brain trip. <laughs> we just did a timeline and the timeline got erased mm. by Time. my phone losing power. Shouldn't we have like the recording recording studio we have needs like to be something else though. Now that the timeline's been erased, there should be some extra it can be all additive. new. Yeah, it's all new now. How could ever happen? All right, so here we are. We're talking about uh, first class. It's me and my wife Joyce and Carmen hey. and Dylan Sanchez, and we're 
about to talk about worldview issues. And one of the things that I want to point out again... (laughs) I don't think you did before. What is this? This It's all new. (laughs) Is that uh, the X-Men universe kind of exists in a fantasy world. They they want to couch it in like scientific language and talk about evolution, but uh, they act like mutation is this thing that can do wonders and yeah, and, it's a positive change. Yeah, and, and create new things and all that. But we know you can find it on creation science websites, uh, answers in Genesis, and see that mutation doesn't add information; it it takes things away. So. A mutant creature is actually a lesser form of whatever it was before. Yeah. And so in this fictionalized version of that, mutation can come along and just grant all sorts of Mm. nifty new things. Mm -hmm. And that's fine if that's the world that you're creating and, and, and that is where we live. Well, isn't it kind of, cause like these are supposed to be halfway, you know, the next step in human evolution. Whereas, you know, if you have something that's kind of got like a halfway mutation, like, uh, well, you were talking, told me about woodpeckers one time. Oh. You know, that they've yeah. got their tongue that's like wrapped around their brain as insulation. <laughs> so if at any point that there's a woodpecker that's born without their tongue not completely wrapped around their yeah. brain for insulation, <laughs> first of all, their tongue is in the wrong spot. And secondly, their brain is going to like right, <laughs> yeah. fly out of their head the first time they try a woodpeck. So, yeah, you know. Right, right. That's that's a real thing. One of the proofs against evolution is the idea that there's no, there are certain systems in many creatures that are irreducibly complex, meaning mm-hmm. that there isn't a simpler version of this. Yeah, it's either this complex system or it's death. Yeah, you know, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> so you don't, you can't take gradual steps to that. Yeah, and. Uh, and so what we see with the X-Men is we see these giant leaps to fantastical things. Yeah, with like Mystique being able to change her entire body. And other things with Mystique, I know I've said, I said the last time that, you know, for her genes to be unstable, that that would make her like clinically ill or something like that to have a g- genetic instability Unable in her to code. live. Unable yeah. to live. But if you watch her transform into different things, she turns from like, you know, her little, you know, Jennifer Lawrence self to uh, <laughs> this big old uh, I'm sorry whoever acted this dude but this big old like CIA man big old fat guy yeah big old fat guy you know <laughs> so then that's that's a a increase as yeah well. that's an increase in, in mass, mass yeah you know so it's, it's, <laughs> there's multiple yeah. like physical laws that aren't working here and yeah. I mean you see it in a lot of them for all of these different things to be happening something has to be broken inside of this person um there's this one mutant uh i think his name's spike but his thing is that he he grows like kind of like how wolverine has bone claws Mm -hmm. but this dude just does it from everywhere and so he just has bones that like grow out of his body and that's like you see somebody doing that in real life you're like dude (laughs) let's get you to the hospital (laughs) you know yeah okay but one of the as we did talk before, I think one of the more interesting worldview sorts of things that happens is the interaction between Charles Xavier and Magneto, mm. especially with regard to their views on normal humans and how mutants should interact. Mm-hmm. And I would just like to point out that in the story, you've got Charles Xavier who's a scientist and that's you know that's his thing and he's very much into evolution and uh, materialistic naturalism mm-hmm. and that's a worldview that really doesn't give you any reason why you should care about your fellow humans we're all just bags of protoplasm and yeah uh, random meat right sacks. meat sacks and there's there's really no reason to show nobility or compassion or anything like that Although you have a theory yes. about, or I forget which one of you had that theory, but go ahead and say that again. Why is it that Charles Xavier, who's got no 
worldview reason to be compassionate. Why is he so compassionate? That's because he's a mind reader. He's a mind reader. And I equated it to the jerk in the supermarket. So y'all know that one guy that you see around town. He's just a jerk. Maybe he's the guy that comes into work and he's just a jerk or he... You yeah. know, frequents your place of business. You know these jerk, people. Or is a coworker, or is maybe related to you. But for some reason, they just are terrible. You know, horrible people. There's no reason for it. They're just one of those scumbags. Whereas <laughs> you just see this person like, ah, this scumbag. Charles Xavier sees this person like, oh, I get you. You know, he like sees this person, yeah. looks inside their head, and understands the whole of this person. You know why they do things the way that they are. Right. And I think that's why he's uh, he's such a good teacher. You know, mm-hmm. like, there's really no reason that he should be able to talk to, you know, what is it, like, five or six kids plus Magneto that he trains and kind of know, like, his stuff that he does with Beast isn't even, like, really training. Like, he just kind of talks him through it. Yeah. You know, when he talks, because he can't, he can't really make them do their yeah. powers different. He has to, like, kind of... Help them through Help it. them get there themselves. Yeah. yeah. That he's but really, he has insight to do that. He has insight into yeah. it. And I think that's why he's so good at it, and I think that's why he values humans, is he can look and see and say, you know what, maybe you're not a mutant, but you're still worth something. Well, and it's more than that, because he persists in believing the best about humans in particular and in general, and seems to me that he gets proven wrong pretty continuously. All the time. And and persists in But he keeps on trying. He keeps on trying. Okay, Dylan, I'm going to give you an assignment. You ready? All right. <laughs> explain, uh, <laughs> explain to me Magneto's view of humanity and why it, how it <laughs> got there. Well, so from his childhood, like this, this is how he got his view. Uh, as a child, he was uh, in Germany in the in the concentration camps and. He ended up getting separated from his mom, as we saw in the movie, and he ended up using his powers to, like, not purposefully, but it ended up happening. And, like, so where people saw him using his powers, and then he ended up, uh, Sebastian Shaw ended up, like, capturing him uh, and taking him in, and he ended up having him, like, he wanted him to use his powers to use him as a weapon for evil. And so... Basically, you know, he killed his mom, and so he he wants that vengeance against Sebastian Shaw, and so now after he gets it, he just has, he wants the same vengeance kind of towards, like, humanity, and, like, he doesn't really have a respect, because he's, like, afraid that as soon as everyone else, that all the mutants' powers get out, that the world is going to have the same reaction that Sebastian Shaw had towards him. Yeah. Uh, one thing that you mentioned in the... <laughs> in the, the other version? Alternate timeline. <laughs> right. He, you, uh, you mentioned that as he and Professor X are kind of arguing about how they should relate to humans, you kind of mentioned that Magneto gets proven right like all the time Mm -hmm. everything that he says the humans will do they wind up doing it and uh and really it kind of i think for me at least there were there's part of me that watches the x-men movies and kind of kind of roots for magneto and and uh you know you kind of understand where he's coming from at least and and it's not like he invented these things in his mind. I mean, he's really experienced this evil in humanity yeah. and the yeah. worst of humanity. <clears throat> and they keep proving him right. They keep reinforcing that. Well, and he says where, you know, I've been, it's all, they're just men following orders. He's like, I've, right. I've dealt with men following <laughs> orders and it sucks. Like, I'm not doing it this It wasn't again. a good thing, yeah. And we've got people in our society today doing that too. The militarized police. Yeah. Uh, you know, well, we have Christians doing that. It's a law. I'm just following. The uh, law, right. I'm just know? doing what I'm told. Yeah. I'm, I'm just respecting. I'm just authority. a mindless idiot. Oh right. wait, did I say that? <laughs> I'm just a sheep. I'm just a meatbag. <laughs> uh, and then Dylan mentioned too that 
the major motivation for Magneto, of course, is vengeance. And mm-hmm. I just wanted to point out that when we were re-watching this, that I was reminded of the biblical teaching that that vengeance really belongs to God. And, and it's illegitimate for men to take the place of God in seeking their own vengeance. And in mm-hmm. fact, what happens then is... If you're going to ignore God's claim on that vengeance and take it for yourself, it's a very similar to sin as like when Adam decided to take the fruit, and even when he was told not to. And, yeah. And it really works out being a form of idolatry. Vengeance belongs to God, but I'm going to take it, and I'm going to do it. And, and so you wind up putting your own hurt feelings, your own injuries mm-hmm. That may be legitimate, but you wind up putting them in the place of God and, uh, in Magneto's case, kind of fashioning your whole life around the pursuit of those things. It kind of becomes a worship issue. So uh, the way he was pursuing vengeance really was a form of idolatry. Yeah. Well, that's what you're left with when you don't have God's sovereignty being in right. control. It's just, it's out of control and I have to be doing this. Right. I'm sorry, Dylan, what were you going to say? Yeah, um, another thing is, uh, I kind of forgot this part, so like, refresh my memory as I'm talking about it, but in the end, um, when they're getting fired upon on the beach, uh, well, what's her name, Moya McTaggart, she ends up like, she tries to contact the ships or, or the CIA or whatever, letting them know that there's people on the beach, and it seemed to me like nobody knew there was people on the beach or something to where she was trying to contact them to let them know, and like, so... Did they know? I, I can't they remember. Did. So. Yeah, they knew she was there, and they yeah. said, we've got one of our people there, and they said, well, she's a casualty yeah, that's no, acceptable. Knew, it's just the one. Were there. <laughs> yeah, they knew the mutants were there, but, and they knew that she was there, but they're like, eh. <laughs> we can live with that. Yeah, yeah. Right. acceptable losses. Yeah. So they, were, they were purposefully taking out the mutants then. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, it, was, it was very... Yeah. All right, all right. Very oh, pointed. I, I forgot about that. Well, yeah, pretty strange. Going back to your false gods uh-huh. sort of thing that that is kind of something that you do see reoccur in that X-Men is different people kind of lifting themselves up to the point of where that they should be worshipped or that you know I mm-hmm. have the power to do this uh, there's a little bit of it with Shaw that you know yeah. that I'm we are better than them because we have this power so we're going to recreate the world with this nuclear war and kind of recreate people into mutants and mm-hmm. you know that this is this is the new order and we're going to usher it in sort of thing. But And sometimes that's explicit. I mean the whole apocalypse movie was kind of about oh, that, yeah. right? And yeah. then and then uh I forget was it X Men two or three where uh Magneto tells Pyro you are a god among, among insects yeah, or yeah, something. Yeah, god among insects. That was one of my working titles for my thesis. <laughs> right. And so, yeah, that that sure does get in there. And along with that feeling that they're a god, there's also this idea that's very prevalent that might makes right. And if mm-hmm. I can do it and nobody can stop me, why should I not do it? Yeah. Which is where you have Xavier's team as the answer to it, that just because you can dominate all these people doesn't mean you should dominate all these people. Yeah. Right. Well, and I think even when uh, Eric is confronting uh, Shaw, you know, he says, I've, I made you who you are, and you're, you know, just join me. Uh-huh. <laughs> He's like, you did, but... But I can't, I can't do that. You killed my mom, you know? <laughs> yeah. Right. And so, even in that, you know, that this man has honed and developed his powers in order to go out and take out this guy, you know, there's, there is some, something twisted about all that. Yeah. That um, it's just kind of hard to resolve, I think. Well, and he says straight up, he's like, yeah, you know, I do agree with you. I think everything you've said about the humans and mutants not yeah. being able to get along. <laughs> yeah. you know. I agree with every word you've said. Right? <laughs> but that was but. my mom. <laughs> yeah. So remember that, children. <laughs> <laughs> remember your mothers. <laughs> remember other people's mothers. <laughs> right. Another issue that we wanted to touch on was Mystique. And the kind of movie-long struggle that she has with self-image and mm-hmm. 
So especially to use the buzzword that's in our day with body image Self issues. Self-acceptance. And yeah. uh, anybody want to talk about that body image or <laughs> is is there a message that was being? I guess I want to know if you think that her struggles were meant to be aimed at like uh, females in the audience. Is there a is well, I don't think it was undertone. I don't think it was or? necessarily just females because you have the same counterpart going on with the beast. Yeah. You know that you know this is who you are. Just accept who you are. And who you are is fine. You don't have to pretend to be somebody else. You don't have to hide. Well, if you look at the three guys that there's kind of she's kind of got like three different options that she can go with. That she can go with like Charles's version that you know, we're just going to blend in with the humans, you know, mm -hmm. we're going to live among the humans and kind of beast's version is that uh kind of halfway sort of thing that, you know, we're going to keep our powers and keep the benefits, but we're going to be just if like we, everybody yeah. else. Whereas uh, Eric's like whole hog, like let, we're, we're different and we're just going to accept it. And we're, you know, yeah. that is how it's going to be because we can't be anything else. And we don't, we don't deserve to have to be anything else, you know? And um, I feel like I've said this before, but <laughs> a lot of the research that's done with, uh, X-Men theoretically in uh, academics and you know stuff like that is focused on uh, kind of the timeline that they came out in was during a lot of uh, civil rights movements and equality movements mm -hmm. so there are some kind of themes sort of built into that because regardless of of what the um, this is my research but regardless of what the originator meant in that mm -hmm. your your product is going to be partially inspired by what you live in even if you say yeah, by your that culture. it's not you know yeah. this is something i completely came up with you still live in something that's going to input to you so yeah even if they weren't trying to make necessarily and i think they they said at some point yeah it's kind of an allegory but even if they weren't <laughs> there is some of that still in there reflections yeah. yeah so um i think there is uh there is a message in there about having to kind of accept yourself and you know how how much of yourself and in the end i think she does kind of make the right choice and she goes the whole hog version with um with eric because she just doesn't want to mess with clothes <laughs> you gotta wear clothes if i have to wear socks she has to wear clothes <laughs> but um you know and you don't always wear, and socks. I don't wear socks i get in trouble about that i have specific socks i'm supposed to wear so i don't wear socks um but uh, well, mom was saying it too, that that's like, there is the whole self acceptance and you have to be what you are sort of thing that there is kind of a negative social con, you know, secular mm -hmm. idea that's attached to that is that this is who I am and you all have to just accept me the way that I am. But yeah. or mom, this is who I think I want. Yeah. Be. That's <laughs> the thing is that, uh, what mom was saying is that there is, uh, there's a lot of that where it's, um, that yes, this is who I am and this is. This, you have to accept me like this, but a lot of people stop before they get to the, this is who I am, a broken and flawed person who needs to be saved from these things that I'm broken and flawed and that are intrinsic within me. Mm -hmm. Whereas most people in our culture are going to be like, I'm broken, I'm flawed, I can't help it, you have to live with it, <laughs> accept yeah. it, you know, and that's not... Broken and proud. <laughs> yeah, and that's, that's not what it is, it should, be, it should yeah. be broken and proud of being saved regardless of that brokenness you know, broken and being redeemed. Yeah. And then you also said that, uh, I'm just par paraphrasing my mom because she's got it all right. Um, <laughs> but there's also churchy aspects of yeah. this as well. There's a Christian aspect of, of it as well. Mm. Um, you know, you talk about, preach about like the gifts of the spirit and everybody mm -hmm. wants to be, you know, the, the, the great prayer warrior and like, I'm going to sit down and, you know, or I'm going to have a prophetic vision and, you know, we all want kind of that thing, but maybe that's not your thing. Maybe you're, you have a gift of service, you mm -hmm. know, and maybe the most that that gift is, is that you're the one that, you know, takes the trash out after the <laughs> banquet, you know, that that's your job and you're great at it. And that's not glamorous, you know, to be the person that cleans up the fellowship hall yeah. or does the bathrooms or, you know, maybe keeps yeah. track of the accounts. But that's who you are, and that's your gift. You don't need to be the pastor. You don't need to be the music leader. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's nothing wrong with that. That there's a lot of organs and a lot of cells in a body to keep yeah. the body working. And you need them all. You need them all. 
I'm reading a book by Charles Koch on business practices called Good Profit. And one of the innovations that the Koch brothers and their business ventures, one of the things they've done, I don't know if he coined the phrase, but he talks a lot about comparative advantage. And what this really works out being is like if you've got if you've got an employee who's great with doing the books and accounting and stuff, not so great with dealing with people and customers, then when that person retires and you go to replace her, uh, what if the person you're replacing her with is not good at the books but is great at dealing with customers? Do you demand that that job have the same function that it did with this other person? Or are you going to be flexible enough to take advantage of the qualities and the comparative advantage mm -hmm. of this employee that you now have? And I think X Men at its best has always tried to kind of do that. And you sometimes you see it in the movie where I'll use my power this way, and that will set you up to use your power yeah. this way. And, working together, and, and then uh, yeah, and so you do see that interplay and and interaction and. To me, that's that's really cool, and that does seem to be one of the things that the superhero movies in general get right a lot. You see the Avengers kind of mm -hmm. doing that too. Yeah, well, that's the whole that's the whole point of a superhero team up is you do your thing, I do my thing, <laughs> and but together we put it's together. fantastic. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you now. I feel like I may have asked this in a different time. <laughs> different timeline. Uh, oh, no. I want to be... <laughs> <laughs> the answer is going to change. <laughs> Tomorrow you wake up and you're a X-Man superhero. Who do you want it to be? <laughs> and why? <laughs> and why? All right, Dylan, you started off. I'm starting? You're starting. I wonder who it could be. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would pick uh, Quicksilver. Yeah. <laughs> what's the uh, what's your reasoning there? Because how cool would it be to get anywhere? Everything done. <laughs> in, like pretty much an instant. I mean, no, it's not teleporting, but it is running, and that's pretty fun. Yeah. 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 Plus, you could eat like everything. <laughs> you yeah. would have to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you can do so cool. everything. Fast. Yeah. Like, I'm yeah. talking everything. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you can do it normal speed, then you can do it super speed. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. That's a good. Uh, just for the eating, I would take that. <laughs> and so you wanted the, your answer was the girl who walks through walls. Was it? Shadow Cat is that her name? It used to be. <laughs> Well, I like the name and I like the idea. I would I would want to do something that was kind of cool but not too cool <laughs> and still like be able to do some stuff. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stay there. <laughs> That's a very mediocre answer. Well, you know, you don't want to stand out too much. Oh, right, right. If you stand out too much, then they start trying to kidnap you. And Yeah. Yeah, that's the downside to my answer. My answer was... <laughs> <laughs> I've always liked Nightcrawler, and uh, so I don't know why you never stay up late. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, <laughs> I'd have to change my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> Just for the tail, I mean, <laughs> there would be a lot of changes. <laughs> Well, and, and this, yeah. the three fingers. And Carmen wanted to become a whole new being. Whole new being. I want to be Gambit. I think it's great. <laughs> If I had to pick a girl, yeah. If I had to pick a girl, let's say you have to pick a girl. If I have to pick a girl, Jean. <laughs> Jean, is, Jean is cool. I'd actually, I might like being Storm. I think that's a cool power set. Yeah. Because then I could nice. make bets with people. This is just where my mind goes, but I could like, <laughs> be like, you know. People be like, oh, well, that's as likely as it, like, freezing over tomorrow. I was like, oh, really? Well, <laughs> let's let's make this a little bit sweeter. I feel like you could take over the world with Mystique's powers, though. Mystique's powers, yeah. I, I do like Mystique's powers a lot, too. But I, I don't know if I'd like turning into other people. Well, and not wearing clothes. See, that's the thing. But I would have to wear socks. <laughs> she just looks weird with clothes on. 
When she's in her form. When she's in her form. If she's a normal person, she looks okay. But, yeah. see, I get it. Why she doesn't wear clothes when she's misty? Because they don't look good on her. Grown up to find a fashion advisor. <laughs> but I think if I had to pick if I had to pick a girl's powers to get, I would take probably Storms. Because that would be... If you do that right, you can, you know, have a lot of fun with that. <laughs> and that's what it's about. Scarlet Witch. Scarlet Witch, yeah. Oh, all my work. That's a little bit too much for me. <laughs> that's a little bit too much power. I She's kind of overpowered, too, isn't yeah, she? Yeah, I just need enough to, like, yeah. co- just sort of... Sort yeah. of coast. See, that's my... Is she okay. Omega level? Is Scarlet Witch Omega? She, I don't know. I'm not sure if she's necessarily Omega level. I would put her at that because she has kind of reset the world a couple times. <laughs> like, nice. Yeah, that's kind of a big deal. Yeah, there's been a couple times in continuity that they've gotten too many mutants, and there's just too many... You wow. can't do it. There's too many, too many mutants, too many powers, too many, you know, all of this, so then... They cut it down, and Scarlet Witch is like, nope, not doing this anymore, and they cut them in half, and then they do it again, and cut them in half. So they get so many, and then they bring them back in, and then get so many. It's like with the... So she's close. She's close. Yeah, I'll put her up there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'd, have to, I'd have to stick with Storm. I know that's, that. That's uh, a level I know that level. the entire X-Men fear her. Yeah. I bet that's right. She's She's crazy. I was doing some reading when we were going to be discussing an Avengers movie, I think. And uh, when I was a teenager reading comics back in the... Day? <laughs> Do you want to say? <laughs> Days of future past? <laughs> yeah, it was actually about that time period. <laughs> uh, early 80s, uh, Scarlet Witch was kind of a minor character off to the side and it was hard to root for her because they never really def- did define what her power set was. I think that's still an issue from what I understand but <laughs> but now I, now I think uh, now she's a uh, she's wow, boss. She's a big deal. Yeah. yeah. Alright, I think that's probably about it for us and, and uh, X-Men First Class we did want to take some time to publicly thank uh, Dylan and his family (laughs) for hosting the (laughs) quarterly reconstructionist and abolitionist meeting and we had a good time there and Reagan thanks them Reagan thanks them (laughs) what? (laughs) Reagan thanks them for the people that recognized you oh okay so the story is that my youngest daughter Reagan had a she told me she believed that Joyce and I were going to go to this meeting and we were going to meet people for the first time who would say upon (laughs) meeting us, oh, Worldview Media Podcast, we love that show. What a great culture show. (laughs) I I, never heard these, though. But I I said, (laughs) I told Reagan I didn't believe that was going to happen. And uh, and so I bet her $20. and, And then at this quarterly meeting at the Sanchez home there were several couples who did that <laughs> uh, one guy I was talking to I introduced myself to him and and Joyce was all over across the living room and she laughed about something and the guy said that's Joyce Runyon <laughs> I'd recognize that laugh anywhere <laughs> and then I was telling another story that there was a guy I was talking to who said that when he first started listening to this podcast, he he it kind of made him mad. He was like, <laughs> "What's this doing on Reconstructionist Radio?" What a silly thing, and, right? Most and, frivolous thing. But then he kept listening and started to understand what we were doing. They were taking Christian presuppositions and. And pushing them into every area of life, and 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 now, With many years. <laughs> now he likes the show, and what he was giving me a hard time. He said, "You guys, you press the button to start recording, and you're already laughing, <laughs> and you don't stop laughing until sometime after you press the button to stop." <laughs> Does he want to know the joke before we push the Because <laughs> yeah, that's probably built back on a joke about two hours before. <laughs> there's no telling. <laughs> Maybe you missed the button the first time. Yeah, it does <laughs> happen. Get the name of the movie wrong. <laughs> right, right. I don't know if he's here. Or just 
look <laughs> stupid as I'm about to start. Right. Or it takes too long to say. So something. anyway, uh, from Fort Joyce, I just want to say it was really humbling and and uh, really gratifying for us to meet you guys, and yeah, especially you who took the time to say that you really do enjoy the podcast. We are serious. We've joked about it on on the air before, but we're serious. It really does blow us away that people really listen. And, and you know, yeah. if we thought there were a ton of people listening, <laughs> we'd probably try to do something for real. You know? <laughs> well, what? <laughs> I, for one, am yeah. not... Gratifying. <laughs> I didn't get to go. I stayed home with the fur balls. So. Uh, so anyway, Dylan, pass on. Thanks to your parents for hosting that. It was good meeting you. And yeah. We're Thanks for joining us. Happy tonight. you were able to join us tonight. Oh yeah, thank you for having me. And go through the time loop with us. And, <laughs> and make this journey twice uh, in one night. Twice as fun. Yeah, all right, brother, you got anything else for us today? Oh, uh, that's it for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's say goodbye, y'all. But let me say hey to uh, Jordan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Shout out to Jordan. <laughs> Shout out to Jordan and our other, what, 10, 20 fans? <laughs> <laughs> and three other people. You know who you are. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that one guy that owes me money. <laughs> <laughs> All right, y'all. Next time, we'll see you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Worldview Media Podcast. Please visit reconstructionistradio.com to check out the other podcasts in our network and to download our free audiobooks. <laughs>